Hello and welcome to Trillion Dollar Opportunity, How a New Internet Will Reimagine Your Business Model, presented by Definity. We are excited to have you be a part of the conversation. You can submit questions for our speakers through Slido by clicking the Join the Conversation button located at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen or by going to slido.com from your mobile device and entering the event code hashtag Forbes Definity. Please welcome Michael Del Castillo, Associate Editor, Forbes. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Time in New York, uh, though I believe we have uh, guests from around the world. So thank you for taking the time to tune in wherever you are. Uh, for those of you who know me, uh, I, I do spend most of my time uh, writing about and covering blockchain and cryptocurrency. Uh, there's a wide variety of applications beyond just Bitcoin, uh, basically anything that requires the movement of value from one place to another, regardless of what that value happens to be. Um, so I was excited when this event sort of started to percolate to the surface and I started realizing that we were going to have a chance to not only talk about the role that blockchain could play in helping build an open internet, but a wide variety of other technologies. Uh, we saw over the last several months, and depending on when you start counting, maybe even years, uh, the importance of a potentially more open internet. Uh, I think in the early days of the internet, we saw uh, entrepreneurs and technology developers, coders, architects, sort of default moving into an open internet paradigm where they were creating technologies that anybody in the world could use with the goal of creating a more connected user base. Uh, as the internet has evolved though, we've seen different business models uh, come to the front, experimenting with more closed versions, or as we like to call them, walled gardens. Uh, I think perhaps most uh, notoriously, you know, our, these walled gardens include some of the biggest internet companies in the world, Facebook, uh, Netflix, Amazon, Google, Twitter, these are all companies that have made billions of dollars um, with what it, today is what we consider a very closed system. However, I think it's important to note that that closed nature was a choice. Uh, and if you'll recall back to the early days of Facebook, uh, you might remember a little gaming company called Zynga uh, that was very, very popular at its time. and, and, and the game company of the time until Facebook decided that it was going to sort of close down its infrastructure. It was going to uh, make it more difficult for other companies to tap into Facebook's core value proposition, which is its customers, which is its, its uh, users, the people like myself, you, your parents who have accounts at Facebook. When they made the decision to do that, they took a step towards a more closed internet. Uh, Twitter is, did the same thing. In the early days of Twitter, there was a lot more open access to their infrastructure. There were companies building directly into APIs that allowed them direct access to uh, the, the, the Twitter base. And we saw some really, really fun stuff evolve out of that. Now, I think in, in part, uh, the decision to, to close down um, was to create a more desirable user experience for some of their clients. So it's not a sort of, you know, big, bad, evil tech uh, um, storyline necessarily, um, though that may be there as well. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, a lot of times a, a more closed internet is actually desirable for some people who want to have a, a little of a filter between what they're exposed to and um, what, what, what is available. Uh, so in, in some though, I think the important part that we want to address today is uh, decision-making going forward. Uh, we, as um, the, the democratically elected leader of uh, one of the largest countries in the world, uh, of course, I'm talking about the country that I happen to live in, the United States, um, was deplatformed from basically every major social media outlet. I, I think a lot of people, it, 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 it hit home that this is happening, um, that the, the possible risks of letting too much power sort of centralize in these big companies 
um, was was real. It wasn't theoretical. And as our businesses of the future are, are, are evaluating what that means, they're going to have to make some really, really difficult decisions, maybe striking a balance between perfect openness, pure, uncensored internet, and something that's a little bit less like what we have now, where it's largely walled gardens controlled by big tech companies. Now, in that process, uh, I, I do believe that we will see uh, decentralized uh, infrastructures like blockchain uh, that could include uh, Definity, that could include Ethereum, that could include any number of public open blockchain infrastructures, um, but it could also include a lot of other technologies all of which I hope we get to address today. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the virtual stage uh, the co-founder of Ethereum and the founder and CEO of Consensus. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the decision-making that he made in the early days of founding Consensus and how other entrepreneurs might be able to learn from that. So without further ado, please help me welcome Joe to the stage. I suppose this is when you would all be clapping. <laughs> hey, Michael. I know. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak. Let my thank, thank you for that rousing ovation. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so, Joe, actually, let me go ahead and flip. I'm old fashioned. I have an actual paper notebook here. Um, so, Joe, what I'd like to ask you to do is um, start off with uh, a very brief overview of what is consensus. And the reason why I want to ask you to kind of define your own company is because in a lot of ways, consensus is part of the story. Um, I, I've heard consensus described as a company. I've heard it described as a hub. I've heard it described as a studio. I've heard it described as a network. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we can describe consensus. And I think the reason behind that is sort of core to what we wanna talk about today. So what is consensus? Sure. Um... So as things do, consensus has evolved over the years. Uh, I started uh, out, uh, well, I, I jumped into the blockchain ecosystem pretty early uh, in early 2011 and uh, uh, read everything I could. And that was nearly everything that was done in the ecosystem back then. You could actually do that at that point. And uh, uh, so I became, I, my background is uh, largely in technology, software engineering, but uh, with a smattering of finance as well. Um, and so I was quite expert, um, but not very active in the space because it was still uh, very in Kuwait uh, and I, I wasn't ready to jump in uh, 24 seven, 365. Um, until I met uh, an individual named Vitalik Buterin, uh, who had written one month before a white paper describing the Ethereum platform. Uh, and uh, at that point, uh, so before that, I, I had a Bitcoin moment, say in 2011, where I realized that uh, top-down command and control systems um, and the trust and faith uh, lost uh, by many people in societal structures, societal systems, uh, monetary systems that were end of lifing uh, from their 70 year debt super cycle. Um, that all was very disappointing to me and other people at that point in time. And uh, when I read uh, Satoshi's white paper uh, describing the Bitcoin platform, I realized uh, we had uh, this new technology that could enable us to build uh, alternative systems, alternative infrastructure. And so it's been how the, the technology that Satoshi described and then how the technology that Vitalik described sort of in influenced the decision making that you made when you founded Consensus. Right. So Satoshi described a decentralized protocol system that enabled people to build um, money. Uh, that uh, had no central issuance or central control. That was a money system uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Um, Vitalik um, described an extension of that paradigm, uh, sitting on the paradigm of Bitcoin, the paradigm, not the, uh, the not the implementation. Uh, but you know, in over the years since uh, Bitcoin was invented, we all realized that hey. Um, this represents a new trust foundation uh, for humanity, and we should start building systems on an 
automated objective trust foundation rather than the subjective trust foundation that uh, that we've been using for millennia. So uh, at that point, I, I jumped into the Ethereum system, uh, the Ethereum project uh, completely. I spent a year um, standing up that project with a bunch of people around Italic and starting the Ethereum Foundation. And then a year into that, I started a company called Consensus, uh, which has evolved in various ways to support uh, that initial vision and mission. So Consensus. So when, you, um, when you launched, uh, to, to my recollection, Consensus might have been the largest organization of individuals to experiment with implementing something called holacracy. Uh, the idea had been around for a while, and I, I think that there were some smaller experiments, but um, possibly consensus was the, the largest sort of big study of what holacracy might look like in the real world. Could you just kind of briefly describe what is holacracy and how do you see that connecting with the blockchain ethos? Why did you decide that this would be worth experimenting with that consensus? Yeah, so holacracy is uh, a flat system for governance um, that is pretty rigidly defined. And I don't think you want me to define that here. Um, and we didn't implement holacracy. We implemented uh, our own version of uh, decentralized organization. And as I indicated, consensus has gone through various phases of development. So uh, in a period in which uh, we didn't have um, much infrastructure, uh, we uh, didn't have much tooling. Um, we didn't really want to try to design an ecosystem top down. Uh, what we wanted to do was bring in the best and the brightest. And, and so we did that and, and we ran lots of experiments and, and we had uh, a lot of power and decision making infused uh, into projects throughout the organization. Um, so as I understand it, it, it um, your, your, your decentralized management structure um, was a, a, a little bit flatter as you used it uh, in the early days and it kind of evolved to be a little less flat over time. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about some of the difficulties of uh, founding and running a company or allowing a company to run itself uh, without a vertical uh, management structure? Um, so some people think that we didn't have hierarchy. Uh, what we didn't have was rigid hierarchy that uh, enabled people to silo information and consolidate power. Uh, we had systems, uh, peer systems, where uh, we had a resource allocation circle where uh, people would listen to other people uh, who had ideas uh, about uh, either continuing to resource their projects or resourcing new projects. Um, so we operated uh, pretty flat uh, back then. Uh, we ran into challenges of of clarity and accountability. And uh, we um, have largely solved those problems now. Uh, early attempts to solve the problems involved uh, building agreements uh, within teams, uh, between teams, um, and uh, currently consensus is uh, essentially uh, coalesced into two organizations, one uh, which uh, is still that experimental thing uh, that is incubating projects and make new investments and, and exploring uh, the future of decentralized protocol technology. Um, but we've seen several projects coalesce into a blockchain stack where we have Ethereum clients at the base and the major infrastructure element in Fura uh, in the middle and the major wallet system, MetaMask uh, as a consumer interface, and the major developer tool system, Truffle, uh, feeding into all of that. Uh, and so uh, we essentially um, have taken all of that uh, experimentation um, and built uh, one of the earliest and most powerful uh, blockchain stacks uh, so that uh, both consumers and enterprises can deliver applications. Awesome. And w w I want to make sure that we get to really um, nail the point about how all of this relates back to the concept of open internet that we're all here to discuss. So I love the turn of phrase that you used that you went with a more flat management structure specifically because you wanted to prevent the siloing of information and power and the consolidation of power. Um, this is, I, I think, two concepts that are really at the core of the open internet. And the idea that a company can be structured 
in such a way also, I think is really important for our audience. So um, if you would take a moment and, and, and briefly kind of wrap things up here uh, by, by talking about the, the importance that it not only must the internet itself evolve, but the companies that are built on top of that also need to change. Absolutely. So companies and governments, I believe, will evolve um, um, with the power of decentralized protocol technology. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the advent of the internet and the web um, for many years, um, as most technologies do, uh, they implemented the business model of the previous generation of technology. So when TV was invented, uh, we had actors standing up in front of the camera and just doing radio plays. Basically, uh, we didn't really understand how to utilize that medium properly. Um, when the web was stood up, uh, all we could think of was to implement the business model of television and radio. Uh, and so uh, we immediately went to advertising um, and that skewed the business model of of the web quite significantly. Um, so it ended up being about uh, getting eyeballs uh, and essentially evolved to addicting people to um, certain kinds of platforms uh, on uh, in the web ecosystem. And so in the uh, de de decentralized protocol technology um, enables us to um, move value to the internet uh, and to build these trustworthy collaboration platforms so that people can participate, small companies can participate with full economic agency and full political agency because these tokens that we're all issuing and firing around, uh, many of them represent somewhere between cryptocurrencies and shares in a company and uh, many of them have governance rights and um, the ability for people to step in and democratize the financial infrastructure for the planet or democratize the government infrastructure, uh, potentially. I, I know some people think we live in democracies, but uh, we, we can do a lot better, a lot more granular uh, right. agency in those systems. And so I, I think uh, in decentralized protocol systems, we found the foundation of a new business model for the web. I love it, Joe. Thank you so much. Again, this is where uh, normally there would be a couple hundred people behind you or in front of you clapping. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. As always, looking forward to following your progress and seeing what you do next. Oh, thanks for having me.